My name is Abigail, and at 34, I had thought that marrying Martin, the kind 36-year-old manager of a local home improvement store, would signal the dawn of a rejuvenating chapter in my life. The world had felt like a promise, a tender possibility wrapped up in vows and the soft smile he gave me when he asked me to be his wife. When we got married, Martin moved out of his parents' house to join me in the three-bedroom apartment I decided to take the plunge and purchase. It wasn't in the heart of the city, and it certainly wasn't a penthouse in some glossy luxury high-rise, yet it was perfect for us. The place was still fairly new, just two years old, affordable and comfortable. Martin never had opulent tastes anyway, or so I thought. As we both juggled our busy work schedules in the early days of move-in excitement, we soon found a delicate balance that allowed us to synchronize our days off. We even started planning our honeymoon, a delightful topic that often found its way into our evenings, filling the air with a kind of charged hope. Those were moments when gladness blossomed straightforwardly within me. I was truly glad I married Martin. But, like the slow pull of threads from a favorite sweater, the atmosphere in our new home began to unravel. My mother and sister want to come over to see our new home tomorrow, so I've invited them, Martin revealed one evening, nonchalantly breaking the news as if it were as common as commenting on the weather. I felt a flicker of annoyance at his failure to discuss the date with me first, and responded, But tomorrow is your day off, Martin. I have to work. Didn't you think to ask me? He dismissed it with a wave, proclaiming it was fine since they'd only be looking around the house, and I relented. Little did I know that the light of the next day would cast shadows on my trust in Martin's decisive character. The evening following Martin's family visit, I returned home after a long day at the university medical office to an unexpected symphony of laughter and clinking glasses. A pleasant aroma wafted from the living room, smells that promised a banquet I hadn't planned for. Stepping into the cluttered room, my eyes met the jovial faces of Martin, my mother-in-law, and sister-in-law, whose merrymaking unfolded around a table that groaned under the weight of food and drink. What's going on? I could hardly conceal my dismay. My mother-in-law raised her glass in a woozy toast, her greeting laced with good cheer, but devoid of awareness. Oh, Abigail, you're home. Done with work? She didn't notice the tension knitting my brow. My sister-in-law, more astute, attempted to disarm me with empathy even as she indulged in snacks. Hey, Abigail, you must be tired. But isn't this place amazing? Her comment concealed a probing fork. It was clear where the food had come from. Martin, my husband, was complicit in their casual plunder of our larder, shrugging off my question about dinner with the simplicity of a man who hasn't had to negotiate boundaries within his own home. They had time, so why not dinner? He said with a smile that would normally tug at my heart, if not for the simmering discontent within me. The situation began to dawn on me like a cold sunrise. They were using our groceries— the thought threatened to curdle the last reserves of my calm. The alcohol, the high-quality meats we took pains to select, even the snacks my sister-in-law treated herself to, they all came from our provisions. Their brazenness crested when my mother-in-law, perhaps emboldened by the wine, exclaimed with a mighty laugh, "'If you have so much in the fridge, there's no need to add more. Who wants that hassle?' She declared it as though it was her right, unsettling me deep to my core." I could only muster a strained smile and a resolve to retreat. I'll just take care of my portion, then. The response was feigned cooperation. I wasn't going to unravel at the seams. Not yet. But as I turned toward my room, the door slammed, a little louder than intended. The noise was an accidental cannonade, signaling an internal battle they couldn't possibly perceive. From behind the closed door their whispers were just coherent enough to prick at my dignity. Is she always this rough? Will she break something in such a nice house? Martin's agreeable voice endeavored to calm the waters. She's tired from work, that's all. I laid awake that night, the events of the evening playing in my mind like a discordant melody. Was this a one-off occurrence, or a herald of things to come? What next? The awaited honeymoon in Alaska seemed both a balm and a distant dream. As our honeymoon drew closer, the anticipation of Alaska's allure seemed to patch up the frayed edges of discontent that had threatened to spread within me. I clung to the belief that our getaways, just Martin and me, 
would keep the reality of domestic tension at bay. Our three nights in Alaska melded into the kind of perfection seldom found outside gloss, glossy travel brochures. We soaked in hot springs, marveled at the auroras, and indulged in local cuisine, ensuring our days were enshrined in joyful memories. Amidst this temporary escape, life was an untroubled stream, and with every reflection of the northern lights in Martin's eyes, I felt a flicker of the ease we'd shared before. Returning home, riding on the quiet high of our short-lived isolation, I was jerked back to reality with a troubling afterthought. Did I lock the bathroom window? I asked aloud, a distant concern since we lived on the fourth floor of an apartment that seemed secure against the world. It'll be fine, Martin nonchalantly assured me. My mother and sister are there. The words struck me like a bucket of ice water. What? Why are they at our place? I kept my voice as steady as possible, masking the rise of anxiety. Oh, didn't I tell you? He was the picture of equanimity as he explained they were to clean while we were away. Left unsaid was that he'd lent them our keys, deciding yet again without my input that our home was theirs to occupy as they pleased. I spent the rest of the journey stewing in silence. When we walked through the door, the scene before us eclipsed my worst imaginings. Another unauthorized festivity unfolded, surrounded by bags that suggested a more permanent stay. Oh, you're back? Did you enjoy your trip? My mother-in-law greeted us, her casualness an aggravating buzz in my ears. The anger in me begged for release. It seared through my veins, fueling a confrontation I'd long sought to avoid. Enough, what are you doing? Please go home. This is our house. The words erupted from me, a volcanic plea for them to recognize the sanctity of our space. My mother-in-law, tipsy from both alcohol and audacity, came back with a scorching retort. This is Martin's house, so there's no problem with whatever we, his family, dat do. Her daughter was quick to add to the conflagration, we should have more right to be here than you. The injustice of their words was the spark that set my restraint ablaze. I pay for this home, too. My voice was an unfamiliar battle cry as I claimed my ground. Then came Martin's voice trying and failing to douse the flames. Hey, Abigail, don't talk to my family like that. We're all going to live here. The fighting words hung in the air, a challenge thrown down without my consent. And what about me, Martin? When did I lose my say? He shook his head, dispensing the final blow coldly. If you hate it so much, you can leave. There, in the heart of the battlefield, his directive became the banner under which I chose to walk away. I left with the knowledge that there was no turning back. The path forward was lonely but liberating. My days unfolded away from Martin and his family. They took their shape as I filed for divorce, sought counsel, and found solace in new beginnings. His world receded, a tale of two months told in unanswered calls and sent straight to voicemail. The day came when Martin's voice broke through the barrier, the desperation evident even through the receiver. Faye, what are you doing? Come back now, he pleaded. His panic hinted at underlying currents I hadn't directly witnessed but recognized. The careful facade he held. The financial stability that was more mine than his. I'm broke, he confessed. I'm drowning in debt. The truth of our married life was laid bare. Without my substantial contributions, he was left to flounder in a reality he couldn't afford, compounded by the excessive spending habits of his jobless relatives. The anger that Martin's situation sparked within me was a distant ember by the time the divorce papers arrived. It was time to confront the final chapter of our shared story. The day I returned to the apartment to gather my remaining belongings, I felt the weight of finality. Martin, pale-faced and anxious, attempted to salvage the shards of our fragmented life. Faye, you really saved me, he said weakly, a man grasping at straws. I'm already ten thousand dollars in debt. Without you, it will only get worse. I could only manage a wry smile. The absurdity of the situation was almost laughable, if it hadn't been so pathetically sad. Then maybe it's time for your mother and sister to start working. Three incomes are better than one, I suggested, a mixture of genuine advice and exasperated retort. The suggestion landed like a boulder in a still pond. Aren't you going to help us out? Martin's disbelief was palpable. The expectation— that I would continue to be their financial lifeline etched in every line of his face. The clarity of my resolve cut through the heaviness of the room. Why should I pay for your living expenses? 
It's your responsibility now. I said I'd consider helping, but I can't support those who won't even try to support themselves. Their protests were white noise as I focused on the practicalities. Packing my belongings, signing documents, pulling away from a shared life that no longer recognized me as a part of it. Good luck, was all I could muster as I closed the door for the last time and drove away. Months dissolved into a past life, and I felt my world expand in ways I hadn't imagined while tethered to Martin's sinking ship. The money that once evaporated into an endless well now funded my passions and travels. My work at the medical office was invigorated, no longer a means to an end but a joy in itself. Then there was the doctor, the one who had lent a sympathetic ear through the tumultuous times. You're really glowing recently, Abigail. His compliment was a bright note in a melody that had regained its harmony. Before long, we found ourselves entwined in a dance that was all new steps and laughter, my heart rediscovering its rhythm. In the company of this man who saw me, not the overstretched savior of a wayward family, but simply Abigail, I was rejuvenated. Martin's plight was a distant echo by then, a cautionary tale, whispered by the wind. Though I sometimes wondered if he and his family had found their footing, I knew any compassion I felt was reserved for a version of them that had ceased to exist the day I chose myself over their chaos. Moving forward, life was full of possibility, an open book where every page was mine to write, unmarried by obligation or unwelcome intrusion. It was liberating, joyous, and wonderfully mine. 